Welcome to episode 224 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to Richard Rich Garcia, who served in the FBI for 25 years. In this episode, Rich reviews his Group 1 undercover operation, where agents set up a bogus company to sell beepers, cell phones, and shortwave radios to Colombian drug smugglers transporting drugs from Central and South America to the United States. The case, codenamed CATCOM for Catch Communications, resulted in charges against 93 drug traffickers, including the leaders of three distribution networks. Rich Garcia was a street agent in the Dallas, San Juan, and Miami divisions. He held management-level positions at FBI headquarters, Washington Field Office, and the El Paso and Houston divisions. Rich retired as the assistant director in charge of the entire Los Angeles field office. During his career, Rich received numerous awards for investigative and managerial operations to include the Attorney General's Award and the Presidential Rank Award. While assigned to FBI headquarters as the section chief of operations for the Information Resource Division, Rich played a significant role in the espionage investigation of FBI spy Robert Hansen. Rich managed and monitored Hansen's activities prior to his arrest. Currently, Rich Garcia is the principal of 3RB Consulting Group, LLC, which uses its extensive global network to put companies and clients together that need services in cybersecurity, assessments, and cyber training. During the case review, Rich mentions responding to the 1986 Miami firefight where agents Jerry Dove and Ben Grogan were killed and working with Bob Levinson, who was held hostage and died in the custody of his Iranian captors. Links to case reviews about both tragic events are included in the website show notes of this episode. Before we get to the interview, I want to welcome new listeners and invite everyone to join my reader team, where once a month I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. This month, I review the new TV show, Clarice. When you join my reader team, I send you my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There's around 60 books on the list now. You'll also get my reality checklist of 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI. There's a link to join my reader team in your podcast app's description of this episode. Now, one last thing, and this is very important to me. My son and I created a fun and educational FBI word search book packed with details and research about the FBI. I just discovered that a major publisher will be releasing in April their FBI word search book. I don't know what the competition will do to our book sales, but if you enjoy word search puzzles, or you know someone that does, please consider purchasing mine. I promise you, my book is at least 10 times better than the other guys. Mine is not your grandmother's word search book. And if you already picked up a copy, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there's a link to all the places that you can buy my books. Thank you so much for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, Rich Garcia. Hey, Rich, how are you? Doing fine, Jerry. How are you doing? I'm doing great. We're here to talk about a case that you worked in Miami. And when you first told me about it, I was just so excited because It is definitely one of those very clever, ready for the movie screen kind of FBI stings. So where do you want to start? Do you want to set the scene for us? 
Well, at the start, it's basically a short history. The FBI attained joint jurisdiction to work drug investigations, which is the U.S. Code Title 21. The FBI was doing Title 18 on those criminal codes and such, but this came about in 1982 on the war on drugs and such. And so the FBI was kind of wrapping their head around how to do drug investigations. Mm -hmm. Program managers for all of the different violations come out of headquarters in Washington, D.C. So the field offices would do operations, but generally they would have to obtain permission from headquarters to do whatever they were doing. At the time when that happened, I was in San Juan and was assigned to the drug program and then worked with DEA there as well and learned a lot of techniques that they were doing. But some of the experiences I picked up there, I didn't realize then would help me down the road. When I transferred to Miami, Miami was kind of like the hub of, of drug investigations at the time. And we're talking in the mid-1980s. This is when a lot of different things were going on with the Medellin cartel. They were chasing Pablo Escobar. They were doing other things to try to do extradition. Lots and lots of loads were coming in through various techniques that were conducted by Carlos Later through the Bahamas, through boats and planes and different things like that. No other field office was actually seeing that type of drugs coming into the country like Miami, maybe except for Los Angeles or New York divisions. It got so bad that the United States Attorney's Office had a minimum of 100 kilos that they would prosecute for any kind of case the FBI or any federal agency would bring to them, which that is almost unheard of in other cities, 100 kilos. That's a minimum. So the FBI generally, when it does its operations on other cases and criminal violations, are pretty parochial. They look at the things as A, B, C, one, two, three. There's rules and regulations and different things. That doesn't necessarily work well in a drug investigation. A drug investigation, you may have plans and everything else and looking at the aspects of what your goal is and, and even the security that you have at the time because those investigations can become violent, especially on the takedowns or during even an actual operation. But Murphy comes in and the last minute, there's a last minute change. So you have to be flexible. You have to be able to uh, move on a dime, be able to adjust and do what you have to do without trying to stop, get your permission from headquarters or advice from headquarters or whatever everything else. It, it was that fast. And so Miami at the time, because the amount of drugs coming in was basically almost right in the rule book for the FBI in general of how to do drug investigations. Why was it that the FBI was so late to the game. I mean, why was it that DEA was doing these investigations and that the FBI, which of course has so many violations that they handle, did not already have a piece of this? What was it that helped make the decision, yeah, you know, the FBI needs to be involved? Well, during the Reagan administration, they had Nancy Reagan's program, Just Say No to Drugs. And George Bush was vice president at the time, and he formed the South Florida Task Force. And in that task force, they put an edict that all federal agencies will be involved with some sort of involvement with drug investigations or collecting and providing intelligence to the DEA for drug investigations. This included the CIA. This included ATF. This included Border Customs and the Border Protection and, of course, the FBI. The FBI being uh, a Department of Justice agency like DEA, it was probably easier to merge that particular violation with the two agencies in order to have a better amount of manpower. The FBI has some 12,000 plus special agents. DEA only has about 3,000 special agents. So it was an actual manpower increase that to look at drug investigations and helping DEA on their violation. But at the time when we were doing the drug investigations in Miami, we had a task force put together on a squad called N2. There was various drug squads in Miami because of the amount of work that was down there. The N2 squad, and when I talked to the, about the people in the, in the case and the cooperating witnesses, I may just use only a first name or a last name or a code name as I don't want to get anybody's full names out, even to include the subjects in the case, too. Just, That's fine. You know, out of courtesy, basically. We knew pretty much everything about who was in charge of the drug. We knew the Medellin cartel. We knew the Cali cartel. But there was a gap between 
the cartel and the drug managers, if you will, in the United States of what was in between. Who was doing the transportation? Who was doing the money laundering? Who was doing security for the loads? Who was acquiring warehouses or stash houses to keep the loads? Who was doing the transportation as far as in-country versus the international transportation just to get it to the United States? So McNally, who's a supervisor of Intu, had a group, which I was part of, with an agent who was part of your series, Bob Levinson. We'll talk a little bit more about Bob, who is very important to the FBI family, at the end of the case review. Great. Bob Levinson was very good in working with the mob intelligence in New York when he was there before coming to Miami. So we had the same approach. We started to do intelligence collection of who was out there and what was going on. We would debrief prisoners that were arrested for drug violations, any walk-ins that would come in for uh, wanting to give information to the FBI. And we had a DEA agent part of that group as well, so we could ensure that this intelligence was shared and we could find out what was going on. As a result, we were able to find pretty much a whole organizational structure to how they operated. We found that the drug traffic was more dedicated to money. If it's the money, then they would be loyal to that. Otherwise, they could care less who they work with. Not like the mob, where the mob is more dedicated to family members. So as a result of all this intelligence collection, which was going on between 1985 when I was in Miami till 1987, I noticed that there was a common denominator that everybody in these organizations had to communicate some way or somehow. Cell phones, believe it or not, back then only came on the market in 1984. So it was only on the market for three years at the time. And I noticed that everybody was starting to try to obtain cell phones. And the cell phones back then were not like the ones now. They were briefcase size, bag size, huge devices that you had to carry on a strap on your shoulder or put into your car and plug into a cigarette lighter. They were not very convenient. They started finally coming out with that brick phone, which you might have seen used in Miami Vice, which was being aired at that time in Miami, where uh, Crockett would have this gray box as a cell phone. Then later on, the flip phone came out, et cetera, et cetera. So I was thinking it'd be really interesting that we could figure out why they're using cell phones other than the fact that they could be anywhere when they make their call and thus feel safe that they're not being surveilled and how we can do that. Lo and behold, while we were doing this intelligence collection, try to further that, we had an individual from Columbia walk into the office and wanted to provide information. Now, this individual, I'm not going to use his name, but we did give him a code name. He was a businessman and was in the office supply type businesses in Colombia. He was actually working and providing information to the CIA at the time. The reason he was doing that is because, believe it or not, trafficking organizations do have offices. So he was able to supply office equipment to various organizations. Some of them were drug trafficking organizations. And he was providing this intelligence to the CIA. Very valuable information. This individual was a businessman. He was non-criminal. He had a family in Colombia, but he was getting frustrated because all the information he was providing, even to include noticing which ships in Cartagena were being loaded with drugs and going towards the United States, that nobody was being arrested. He did not realize that the CIA collects intelligence. They do not do the enforcement part of this thing. The CIA would provide the intelligence to DEA, FBI, or other agencies who in turn would then open investigations and result in arrests, if possible, from those investigations. So being frustrated and complaining, if you will, he went on his own, traveled to Miami, and he told the CIA he wants to work for the FBI, which they did not really like that idea, but he did. He came down here, got a hotel room, walked into the office, and started to provide information. The duty agent at the time... What are we uh, going to call him? Uh, I'll, his code name came right after he came into the office. We found out that this individual was also technically inclined. He enjoyed shortwave radios. Computers, believe it or not, were just coming out. There was the DOS programs uh, and such, not like they are today. The Internet was not even operational as far as to the public at the time either. And so 
his interest in gadgets and such, we decided to call him Byte, B-Y-T-E, like in the computer Byte or program Byte. And so we gave him that code name and he provided information to the duty agent at the time, which is an agent that's assigned each day to taking complaints from walk-ins or over the phone. The duty agent passed the communication or the report to McNally Squad, and in turn, McNally provided it to Levinson and myself. We did an initial debriefing of Byte, and it was decided that they were going to assign Byte to me to open him up as a cooperating witness in order to collect information and start reporting it up the line to different things with the Intel group we were doing. Well, after a few months of reporting, uh, Byte and I would meet in different things, and he was starting to get frustrated with the FBI and myself because then again, nobody was still being arrested. And the reason being, nobody was arrested because Byte did not want to testify. And without him testifying, we could not arrest anybody he was providing. We had to develop information third party and utilize that person or that investigation through third party sources in order to use them to testify and not use by to protect him. So I tried to explain to him that if you really want to do something interesting and magnificent and such and do a real bang up job against the cartels, testify. And he said, no, I don't think I can do that because I got family in Colombia and different things like that. So we continued to meet. Then one day in a coffee shop down the street from the office on Biscayne Boulevard, and this is the old office location. I think the old office now is a police museum, believe it or not. I told him, I says, look, I have a friend of mine who's a regional sales manager for Bell South Mobility. He keeps telling me about all the monies that they're losing to individuals that are obtaining cell phones, running up extensive bills at the time, because back then, they charge you by the minute of what you use on the phone so it can get expensive. It wasn't like it is today where you have a, you own the phone, you have a flat rate and you can make as many calls as you want. Well, back then, whoever had the phone was not paying their bills and they were losing thousands and thousands of dollars. And so I thought, I asked him, I said, what would be the possibility if the FBI would open up an undercover operation where we were a cell phone provider or vendor for Bell Soft Mobility? This way, we could identify who these individuals are, eventually arrest them, get the payments from them and pay you, and set up an operation. And the guy from Bell Soft Mobility says, if you decide to do that, he says, he'll provide the necessary security and backstopping, and backstopping being that they do different things in place where if somebody does an investigation on you or an undercover operation, there is actual evidence to show that you're legit. We call that backstopping. He'll provide the necessary backstopping, provide the necessary licensing to be a vendor for Bell Soft Mobility, et cetera, et cetera. What he would do also is give us bulk phones. In other words, number of telephones, but they're all registered to the company. And what we would do then is provide these phones to the customers, generally bad guys, and tell them, you'll have this telephone. You can make all the calls you want but it's going to be registered us in the company. So if law enforcement subpoenas that number because they find that number through one of their investigations, they'll come back to us and not to you, thus protecting your identity. And you can be kind of free, do what you want to do. And we'll take payment in cash or whatever. And if they come to us for investigation, we'll just tell them, we don't know who you are other than a name. We'll just give them a fake name. And then we get paid cash every month for your service. End of story. And that we thought would be a good carrot to attract the bad guys. It gives them protection. It also gives them the ability to do what they want to do and with the possibility of not being identified by law enforcement. So I offered that pitch to Byte at a coffee shop and told him, it says, we can open up a business, provide cellular telephones, and at that time also pagers, which were then digital pagers, not alphanumeric, and other services and such, and have you run the business. He thought about it and he says, well, what about my family? Well, we can arrange to bring your family here. We can also arrange to relocate you at the end of the case. But this case could possibly go for a long time. So that won't have to happen right away. And we can collect a bunch of information and intelligence and make a lot of arrests and such on these organizations. He decided to do it. And so I took this 
idea, if you will, to McNally and pitched it to him. The FBI has a couple of ways of where they do undercover operations. There's a field level authority, which you can open up an undercover operation for a short time frame, what they call as a group two undercover operation or UCO. But it had limitations. You had six months only to operate. You only had a budget of $20,000 max to utilize in that case. If you wanted to go into a group one UCO, that requires FBI headquarters approval, review by the Department of Justice, review by various programs and, and supervisors at headquarters, and your budget can be larger than 20000 but then again, it has to be detailed and also approved by the FBI's budget because the undercover budget that's provided by Congress is limited, and you're in competition with other field offices for that same money. So they have to decide at headquarters which cases that they will approve versus not approve based on priority and the idea they might be successful and what's the impact. So I pitched to the McNally and he kind of looked and he says, so let me get this right. You want to be able to open up a store with this guy bite, provide cell phones to bad guys. And then from that, we do arrests. And he said, yeah. He said, we do arrests. He says, the guys who are going to be targeting are transporters, people that coordinate the drug loads coming from Colombia to the United States. The transporters are generally what we call mopes, non-important individuals that are hired to do the load or the transportation. We can provide information to Border Patrol, Correction Customs, or the Coast Guard and have them intercept these loads, seize the drugs, and arrest the transporter at that point. However, the main person or the, the leadership, if you will, in the United States will not be arrested to the end of the case, but we will have be able to, with the evidence, talk with them at the, at the company, using the information from the cell phones and the analysis of the calls, able to add them as a conspirator to these massive amount of drugs that are coming in. So he said, all right, but I want you to get a couple of other people on the squad to help you on this case and put a proposal together and let's do it. So he gave it one of the other agents who I worked with, a guy named Carl. Carl and I would do a lot of the operational part of the intelligence that Levinson and myself were gathering from debriefing prisoners and different things like that. And Carl was a very, very good agent. He was also technically inclined, was one of those agents that was experimenting with computers in the office that were the few that we had in the FBI at the time, writing programs and different things like that. But Carl would, with the information from our intelligence group, identify a target on a Monday, ensure that the target was arrested by that Friday, and utilize an SOG team, which is our special operations group or a specialized surveillance team, to help in these these uh, cases where he would develop more intelligence of where these guys were talking to who, who they're meeting, places they were going, and then the arrest. And when they arrest them, we would then take that subject and if he would cooperate, debrief him as well between Levinson and myself. He was known as that one-week case guy and very good. So I got Carl in. I explained to him what was going on, told him what the concept was. So because of the little budget we had, we found a two-room office in a strip mall to put the business. And we would have Byte get the necessary paperwork from my contact at Bell Soft Mobility in order to open up as an authorized vendor, which came with that signs and other publications to show that you're an authorized vendor for Bell Soft Mobility, as well as some dummy phones and such for a display case, et cetera. And then what we couldn't really tech up, what I call tech up the office in order to record the conversations, we had a portable recorder. We had a still camera that, that Bai could operate himself to take pictures of who comes into the place. And we have what we call a transmitter to where we can listen to conversations as they go on nearby. I'll be in the car listening who he meets with and, and collect the intelligence and go from there. So we started to do that, that setup, get the office straightened out and everything else like that. Byte would look for customers by going to the Miami airport. Not like it is today with TSA and you can go to the gates and such. Back then in the 80s, you could go to the gates. And so he would go to the Avianca airline flights arrivals from Colombia. And with a handful of business cards, he would look at the people coming off to see if he could recognize anybody. 
with his business in Colombia, he was able to understand and know a lot of the traffickers, who they were, a lot of the people involved in Cartagena and those areas and such. And occasionally he would see somebody from that particular previous business coming off the plane. He would go to them and say hello, give them his business card, tell them that he had a way to provide untraceable cell phones, which got the interest of the people generally. They would ask him, he says, why are you here? He says, well, I have a friend coming in from Columbia. I'm just here to meet them as an excuse why he was there at the airport. But he would do that consistently every day. And eventually, one of these individuals, a guy named Tico, he met and he knew was a trafficker, came off the plane. And he gave him the business card. And Tico says, I may talk to you soon. So Byte was excited because he knew Tico was a good player. When I say player, a trafficker, he called me up. He arranged, told me when the meeting was going to take place. I got a hold of Carl. Hey, get a hold of your SOG buddies. We may have to watch who this guy is. SOG, Special Operations Group. That's a section or a squad, and sometimes in the larger office, several squads of agents who are surveillance specialists. They utilize various techniques, various vehicles, to include even aircraft, to handle their surveillances of whatever violation that they're working with on the case agent or the agent assigned to a particular violation. So Carl and I are in the alley in our each respective vehicles, and we're kind of car door to car door, you know, so we could talk. Carl was on the radio coordinating the SOG team coming in. I was on the other radio system listening to the conversation in the meeting between Byte and Tico. And the, I could hear the radio from Carl of the SOG team and, and the team leader Asked Carl, hey, Carl, is this going to be one of your one-week cases? He says, not sure yet. He says, there's a guy in there. We want to be able to follow him when he comes out, but don't get too close. We just need to identify him and see who he meets and where he lays down his head as far as to go to sleep, kind of ID him further. They said, okay, okay. And Carl kept on asking me what they're saying. And they said, they're just doing general talk. They're talking about phones right now. And I told Carl, hold on a second. And I'm listening, and Carl's getting anxious. What are they saying? I'm going to keep putting my hand up. I said, hold on. I'm listening. And I said, Carl, he says, Tico asked Byte if he could obtain some sailboats because he had some cocaine he wants to bring in off of the coast of Panama from an island, Belize. He said, how much? He says, 10,000 kilos. Carl had a stunned look on his face. He got the radio in his car, and he called out to the SOG team leader. He says, Hey, guys, when this guy comes out, give him a lot of room. We don't want him to burn the surveillance because I think this is going to take a little bit longer than a week. And so it began. And so it began. So we went with this information back to McNally, briefed him. He asked, he says, 10,000? I said, yes, sir, 10,000 kilos is what he said. Apparently, we did tie this guy that he transports for Pablo Escobar, one of the main Medellin cartel members. So the amounts was legitimate as far as what was coming out. We had basically at that point within that first month, the basis to write a proposal for a group one undercover operation in order to have a better office, better equipment, the ability to record and capture evidence through videotaping and microphones and other types of techniques that we would be able to develop in group one and have a budget in order to sustain the operation itself. So we start writing a proposal, submitting it to headquarters. And during that time from March 87 to August of 87, we continued to collect more information and intelligence of the loads that are coming out from Miami. The one for the 10,000 kilos for Tico took a direction towards Mexico versus Florida. However, we were able to provide the intelligence to DEA and DEA, working with the Mexican federal authorities there, were able to intercept or ensure that the load was not going to get into the United States. So as we continued to do this operation of developing the Group 1 proposal, McNally decided that, okay, we're going to need to put an agent in him to work undercover as a partner. So it was voted that since I had the rapport with Byte, that I was going to be that undercover agent that I was going to be in his office, not necessarily full-time in the office, but an undercover, but coming in part-time to do different things. And one of the areas that they wanted me to specialize in is to be a tech-type agent. 
Tech were type you, agent. Were you, yeah, I was going to say, were you a tech agent? And also, had you worked any undercover mm-hmm. assignments before? Let me start with the tech part. The tech part is I always been one of my goals to try to be a tech agent. And for whatever reason, the management never did allow me to be a tech agent other than an apprentice or a part-time tech agent, which is somebody that kind of can go with the tech agents to learn a little bit of operations. And then they decide at some point that there's an opening to become a full-time tech agent, which is an extreme amount of training in Quantico, Virginia at the academy to learn various techniques of the technical program. You can do that. However, that never came about. I did my tech work when I was first office in Dallas, Texas. I did my tech work with the DEA in San Juan when I was working the drug investigations. And I was able to do some tech work in Miami and such, but never become designated to go to be a full-time tech agent, which was my goal, but that never happened. As far as undercover experience, there was a case early on before I was in Miami where it was a civil rights investigation and they needed a Hispanic agent to play the role of somebody that was walking or kind of being smuggled into the area because it was a corruption case with a sheriff's department where they were stopping these immigrants and such and taking bribes in order to let them go or turn them into border patrol. Unfortunately, at that time, I was the only Hispanic in that office. And so they said, hey, let's use Richie. He can be the undercover. And everybody was thinking, said, well, yeah, but, you know, I knew he was a cop before and probably had some experience in the street and such, but he's never been an undercover. He needs to talk to Joe. And I kept saying, who's Joe? And he said, no, nah, don't worry about it. We'll figure this out. Long story short, that Joe was Joe Pistone, which you had one of your podcasts on, the Donnie Brasco guy with the mafia. I was able to meet with Joe, and Joe was still undercover in his mob case, but it was getting towards the end, and he was listening to the real, real tapes of the case in order to build the indictment because he was about to be exposed as an agent. So he sit down with me, and he says, say, kid, I understand that they're going to have you work an undercover case. And I explain, yeah, it's, it's a corruption type thing. I'm supposed to be an immigrant, et cetera. And before I know it, he has me standing up, his hands on my throat, push me against the wall, starts screaming at me, who are you? Where are you from? What's your name? This and that and everything else. And I'm going, what the hell's going on? And then he backed off. He said, sit down. And he started to tell me, he says, look, you got to be prepared as an undercover. You got to know your background. You got to know who you are. You got to have this this background set up. And if it's a long-term undercover operation, you got to have something very similar to your own background in order to keep up that lie. And there's different things he was telling me. And I remember he was telling me says, about bad guys. You don't have to be the alpha all the time. You don't have to play the guy who's the hard ass because then they're going to try to follow you. And then you got to come up with cases to do because they're going to get suspicious about you. Play on their ego, play on their, their leadership. And remember, bad guys go to the movies too. I still remember that. He said, you don't have to be a bad guy 24 seven. If you want to go to the movies, ask one of them to go with you if they like. And so it was a very valuable lessons that he provided me in that one-on-one session, not knowing who Joe was and what the case he was doing and about to come out and get exposed. I felt very fortunate to have had that opportunity to learn from him. So this is during a period that there wasn't a formalized undercover training program in the FBI. And that is correct. And when I was doing this thing with CATCOM, and which I forgot to mention is the code name we gave for this case. And CATCOM stands for Catch Communication, being the cell phones and the capturing we were doing. So when CATCOM came around, we did not still have an undercover school per se. It was just being formed at the time. They were just trying to get their the ability how they're going to have that case or how those agents can be trained and such. But that was not at that point yet. So there were some things that we were doing kind of like what we have in the past as far as experience and figuring out what they can do and what kind of training that an undercover may need in order to accomplish the case. In this particular case, being a tech person for the company, I would have to be a specialist on how mobile phones are installed into vehicles because a lot of times they were hardwired into vehicles at the time in the 80s versus mobile or handheld. I had to learn another technique, something we call countermeasures. Countermeasures is when you would go in with equipment into a room, a vehicle, boat, aircraft, or whatever, 
and look for uh, hidden microphones or other tracking devices and such that law enforcement may be using against a bad guy or competitors are using against you. There is equipment that's commercially available, and then there's equipment that's highly specialized and customized for government use only. So I had to learn that particular process as well. So in the interim, before we got the Group 1 approved, my contact at Bell Soft Mobility, utilizing my undercover identification, which I was able to identify an individual down in South Texas to kind of parallel his criminal background, which was very minor, no real prison time at all and such, and then kind of have it similar to what I have. That way, if somebody would do a check or have some sort of background check on individuals, it could potentially say that could be him, and but not really for sure it's him, and, which has always been the case sometimes when you have not a complete set of data on the intelligence or in the data system. At that time, it was the National Crime Information Center, or NCIC. And so I used that ID, and the guy at Bell Soft Mobility was able to send me to their installation school for Bell Soft Mobility in Atlanta, Georgia, which they would normally send people that are going to be vendors for them so that there's a consistent methodology, if you will, of how they install phones and such in order to ensure the customers were satisfied with the product. So I went to Bell Soft Mobility School in Atlanta on an undercover basis. I was in class with other people. They had no idea I was an FBI agent. And to graduate, you actually do an installation of a phone itself and the next car that would come in for service. Fortunate for me, the next car that came in was a Jaguar, which had a unique electrical system for cell phones that it got the instructors nervous that I actually had the instructors help me install it. So I kind of passed that course real easy on that one. I was lucky. (laughs) <laughs> so then the Bureau then sent me to Quantico to the tech program to learn countermeasures. And I had one-on-one lessons on that, on how to do countermeasures activity and such. And the equipment uh, that we have was commercial available. So that way, if somebody checked on me and saw the equipment, they could find the fact that that can be purchased on the street. It was not a government-type device to which you could draw suspicion to. So we're getting all this prepared for me to get to the point where I can introduce Byte in the new Group 1. Well, the Group 1 gets approved in August. I find a warehouse district that we have joining offices. And when I say joining offices, one side was going to be our monitoring plant, where we're going to have agents and translators and such monitoring the cameras, the microphones, and the radios and phones and such. So that way they can coordinate with SOG teams outside and the case agents and such of what's going on in the actual office. Wow. So they're going to be right on site. They're going to be right on site. So Byte came up with the name of RA Communications for the company. R was for Richard, and A was for his real first name communications, which I thought was kind of uh, interesting. I told him, thank you. I appreciate that. But, you know, you put me first in the name, so you almost give me some importance on the thing. <laughs> so he kind of laughed at that. The other company next door, we call it OCF Company. And it was initials. And it was we had it as a mainframe repair shop with 24-7 on the, the sign capability. So that way, it was an excuse why cars might be there all hours of the night or day or weekend. So that way, anybody coming to the RA communication business won't be suspicious if we had something going on late at night and there was a car there. So that OCF company basically was initiated for organized crime fake company, trying to put (laughs) some humor into any kind of investigation we do to kind of see what we do. I always term working undercover is that your ability to talk the bad guy to drop his pants in the middle of Main Street without him knowing about it. That's when you know you're successful as an undercover. Right. That's some manipulation. It is manipulation and different things like that. And a lot of times you're trying to see whether or not you are successful as an undercover or successful as a business, as an undercover business, because you never know what attention can be drawn to yourself. You never know the equipment that you have in there. Is it going to be suspicious to somebody coming in or why you have certain things and different things like that? And also the, as an individual, you know, who they are, because I remember in the Stone's case, I think NYPD Organized Crime Group investigating the mob actually had the Stone's picture and listed him as a, an associate of the mob, which is good because his undercover identity was solid. They did not know he was a government person. So you needed to have that. 
later on in the case, we knew we were good because there was an investigation in Miami of corrupt Miami police officers. They call them the Miami River Cops. Two of them actually came into the office looking for cell phones, and they were out on, on bail at the time, and we would provide them cell phones. We also had two undercover, if you will, DEA agents come into the office trying to figure out who we were and such. And I did not know they were it, but the monitoring room had recognized them and called me on the phone as a customer and kind of told me on the phone while I was talking to these guys that, hey, they're DEA checking you out. And so, but thank you. And so this information that we would find out about who might be looking at RA communications as a potential bad guy place, whatever, was coordinated by McNally and the other agencies uh, when things came up in order to ensure that it was stopped or intercepted and such so it, we don't have a raid on ourselves and have cop against cop, if you will. So we knew that we must be doing something right because we're drawing the attention of law enforcement, even federal law enforcement. How much of your business is legitimate? Because I assume that, you know, there are people walking in off the street that, you know, you're not interested in targeting, but because you are operating this business and you want it to appear to be real, that you're actually selling equipment to. Oddly enough, the entire time we had the case open for RA communications, we had only one legitimate customer. And I think they were looking for a cord and we had a profit of one dollar. It was amazing of the networking that was conducted by word of mouth of the services that we were doing, which was also amazing on how we were able to find out how closely connected all of the other traffickers in the leadership part of the cartels was either aware of or knew. So the doors are open in August. It was a nice office set up. I got to, as a tech agent, wannabe, if you will, I got the privilege of helping wire up the office and such, which was good because I knew where everything was in the office and how it was set up as far as microphones and angles of the camera, what was in picture, what was not in picture, all those different little things. So it was uh, good for me to learn that as well, as well as, you know, doing all the phone work in there, which was part of my countermeasure part that I had to know that too when I would go search a house or a business to see if there's microphones and such. So it was all on-the-job training for me as well, setting up the undercover operation. So it sounds like, even if not officially, you did get that opportunity during your career to be a tech agent. But one of the things we found that, besides having the, the proper props in the office, was that the traffickers, believe it or not, that the hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars they would make bringing in loads and such, they were basically cheap. They would figure out any way they can to save a dime. So we had a phone, or I'm going to call it a pot, plain old telephone, next to the sofa inside the office for where Byte's office was. And that was a pretty large office. I had a smaller technical office next door. We had a uh, one-vehicle garage where we could do installations and plus a lobby in front. We had cameras all over the place that were exposed as security with the monitors in the office, which the bad guys can see front entrance and the lobby and such, and which they thought it was great because they could be back there and feel secure that they know nobody was coming in the door because they could see through the camera. Those was all part of the scenarios. But we also installed a shortwave radio. We also had a money counting machine on the table. We had other equipment and such that would be beneficial for the traffickers to utilize at our office to do their operations. But that phone that we had next to the sofa was a gold mine. Byte would do a lot of the groundwork of telling traffickers why I was doing certain things, what my services were to try to build my, my reputation and my abilities to be trusted by them. And the phone was told to the bad guys that I pirated the phone line and I ensured that it was not traceable and they could make long-distance phone calls anywhere in the world as long as they want, and there would be no charge. So hopefully to get them to call Columbia or call whoever they needed to call. And we were able to later get a court order wiretap or Title III on that phone and record the conversations. Because if there are times that they want to talk on the phone and want to be private, we will leave the office. So therefore, we can get the conversation on both sides of the conversation that phone call. It was a gold mine as far as intelligence. After a while, they were getting so trusting 
of the office and Byte, because Byte was in his early 50s as far as age. And in the trafficking world, age means something. It means that, one, you're good at what you do because you haven't been killed, because generally everybody gets killed in their 20s and 30s because they screw up some way or whatever rivalries are going on, and you haven't been arrested. So they kind of were listening to him, and Byte was very good at BS talk. He he could have been he could have talked your pants off anything. He was incredible. Before we actually the operations and such, Byte was invited to a um, baptismal in Coral Gables in a ritzy hotel. The uh, couple were having a celebration of the baptismal of their son. The wife had a dress that was supposedly ten thousand dollars in value. To give you an idea of the type of place, sit down dinner. They had a band, they had everything, and they had a videographer taking videos of the party and such of everything else. So Byte went up to the guy taking the video and says, look, my wife is in Columbia. She couldn't make the party. Is there any way I can buy a copy of that tape, which he did? And we were able to take that videotape and isolate headshots of everybody in there in order to use those photographs to further identify who was what. And we had a gold mine of traffickers attending that particular event. And a lot of them eventually were customers of RA Communications. Was that Byte's idea on the spot, or was it something that you asked him, you know, if he had the opportunity to do for you? It was his idea on the spot. Wow. He could have been a very, very, very good FBI agent, let's put it that way. So Byte had this business going on. He had customers. He was promoting what I was doing. And this was August. We were getting loads intercepted. And how the loads, give you an idea, were being intercepted. Tico also had another load of uh, cocaine coming in and got a sailboat called the Delta Marie. One of the services we were providing was also making hidden compartments on these boats, whether it be fiberglass or other types of compartments. We had brought Byte's family in from Colombia. The oldest son was in his late 20s and actually got him engaged with the operation too, working with his dad. So we had to get code names to him as well. The other two two sons were younger. One was 14. The other one was six years old. And so since Byte was Byte, we called the son Bit. We called the 14-year-old Itty Bit and the six-year-old Tinsy Bit. And Itty Bit and Tinsy Bit were not really on the case itself, but we had them as code names. So when we referred to them, the agents and such, they knew who we were talking about, digital family members. So... Byte and Bit were working full-time. I would show up daily, but not there at the office full-time. Zelda Marie was coming in, and the, the bad guys, when they would get these cell boats or other boats or even planes bringing loads in, they would get Anglo persons to actually be the pilots, captains, and different things like that, people that look like tourists. It would be less suspicious of the people coming in, so that way they don't have customs or Coast Guard be as suspicious when they were doing a boarding of a boat in the waters just for checking who they are. If they were Latino or Latin, then it might be suspicious and they don't want to do that. So they were using all these Anglo individuals as boats, captains and such. Well, Tico got the boat to Velda Marie, bit, did the fiberglass work for the hidden compartments and such. And then all of a sudden, Tico decided to bring the boat captain and the mate to the office, which was a problem. And the reason is a problem is that they're in the office on videotape being recorded, talking about the Velda Marie trip they're going to take. So if we arrest them through Coast Guard or Customs, then we had the, to deal with the issue of the Speedy Trial Act discovery as far as giving the information on how we got the evidence against them to their attorneys, thus eventually exposing RA communications and it could bring a real quick end to the case. So we had to come up with a way to seize the load and allow these captain and mate to escape and not be arrested. So we coordinated with Coast Guard because one of the other services we provided, which I did, was provide navigational equipment to the various aircraft or boats and such. And just to say we had a tracking of this device. I was working with the technical people at DEA for these devices, and we coordinated with them. And I would install it on the sailboats or whatever, and we provided this information to the Coast Guard as the coordinates were coming in where these boats were. Through shortwave radio contact from our communications to the boat, Tiku would know, and of course we would know because we're there, that the load was on the boat and they're on the way in. We would then coordinate with Coast Guard to intercept the boat. 
So in this particular case, Coast Guard will get on the boat and they will drill holes into the various compartments to see if they come up with white powder or cocaine or drugs. We told the Coast Guard where the drugs were so they would not search those areas and find any drugs. So they were able to search and they told the crew, they said, no, we can't find anything, but we want to check the keel of the boat. So we're going to tow you into Key West and pull the boat out of water, check the keel. Well, that took three days to come in with a tow. The captain and the mate were fishing with the Coast Guard and he had these photographs that they sent us and provided us of them holding fish up next to the Coast Guard guy on board as they come those three days to Key West. They get into Key West about three o'clock in the morning. We basically tell them, this, and this is the Coast Guard telling them, they said, once you guys take off, go find a place to drink coffee or whatever and come back in daylight and we'll talk then, thinking that they're going to run away. They did not. They went to a coffee shop. They called me that early in the morning on my mobile. He says, hey, you ain't going to believe this. They said, we got stopped by Coast Guard. They searched the boat. They couldn't find it. They're pulling the boat out to check the keel. We know it's not in the keel. We're going to go back and get our boat back. They says, really? They said, you sure you want to do that? I said, oh, yeah, they're, they're really dumb. They haven't found anything. They're never going to find that stuff. So I said, okay, well, where are you at? And he told me the coffee shop they're at. says, let me call you back. I called Carl, who was down there in Key West as well. He said, Carl. The captain called me. Yeah. He said, he's coming back. He said, what? He's coming back for the boat because he says, you guys didn't find any dope and he knows it's not in the keel. He said, man, we already got 127 kilos out of the boat. They can't come back. And he said, where are they at? And I told him the coffee shop. So Carl came up with a plan. He sent a female and male agent into the coffee shop. They got into the booth next to the guy and they started talking loudly about all the commotion on dock where the Coast Guard found the sailboat and they got all these cocaine out of the boat and they're looking for two individuals who are on the boat. They noticed that the captain and the mate just kind of ran out of the coffee shop. <laughs> I, got a, I got a call from them right after that. It says, man, it was freaking miracle. It's a freaking miracle. What happened? It says, oh, there's this couple. They're talking about the boat. They found the cocaine and they're looking for us. We got to get the hell out of here. He says, well, let's see if we can do something about that. So we got, long story short, we got Tico to provide a safe house in Tampa where these guys could hang out and, and lay low. And we kind of kept tabs on them to the end of the case when we finally arrested them for that particular trafficking operation. But that's how we were able to skirt the idea of exposing RA communications through discovery by seizing the load and arresting them. Yeah, because there is no way they were going to be able to release that boat back to them. No, there's no way. And, and we had several boats like that with different things. And there's one time they wanted us to uh, hire the crew. So we hired FBI agents to be the ones piloting the boat. And so in that particular case, we're going to say, let's fake a sinking of the boat and lost at sea type thing. So they won't be able to follow up on court actions of the people arrested, et cetera, et cetera. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> the boat name was not N-A-U-T for fun. And it really wasn't because they actually went into a storm, 15 foot swells. The agents actually were calling for an SOS help because the mast was broken, the, the fuel tank was leaking, and the boat was taken on water. So we had to actually rescue the agents off that boat. We took the 407 kilos of cocaine off the boat. Of course, they got that first before they got the agents off. And then they had to sink the boat because it was a hazard to the waterways. So we faked radio transmissions from the Coast Guard cutter of help to RA communications so Tico can hear that. We also faked a report from the Coast Guard about a sinking of the boat and loss of life to show the, the bad guys that this actually happened. Because we learned, you know, during our intelligence debriefings and such with Levinson and myself, that the bad guys in Columbia especially have an OPR what we call Office of Professional Responsibility in the FBI, local police department, we call it Internal Affairs. Basically, they would send an investigative team to investigate all seizures to ensure that the seizure was legitimate by law enforcement and not stolen by the actual trafficker. And if it was seized, they try to get a verification of the amount seized to ensure that the trafficker didn't steal part of the load before it was seized. And there were various types of remedies that the traffickers had as a result of the investigation. If it was legitimate seized for the amount seized, they will work a payback payment plan with the trafficker to reduce rates of the next transportation or doing for free in order to make up the loss. If the loss was stolen or partially stolen like that, 
it didn't turn out too well for the traffickers because they were generally killed. Yeah, I was. <laughs> I don't think there was a forgiveness program. There wasn't a forgiveness program, no. But so we had to provide this type of documentation or something for the investigation to show that this boat, in fact, sank, which it did. It wasn't intentionally meant to sink, but it, fortunately it did. And so this is the type of things that uh, we had to do throughout the case. The turning point, as, as far as my acceptability as a undercover or bad guy at the RA, came on the night before Thanksgiving in November of 87. I was closing up the shop, and I had sent and bite and, and bit home uh, because it was Thanksgiving. And just as I was closing up, three traffickers showed up with beer and food looking for bite. I told him, I said, now he's not here. And he says, well, why don't we go ahead and uh, have some food and drink? So we did. And they brought up the conversations. Uh, he says that you, you, you do technical stuff. And then so I took that as an opportunity to bring out some of the countermeasures equipment and explain what I do with the thing. And one of the traffickers jokingly said, hell, he's probably recording this right now. And I just laughed. Of course I'm recording you guys. What do you expect? And then one other trafficker said, ah, they record your voice. You could always say it's not yourself. You can always say it's somebody else. But when they really get you, is they get you on videotape like they did Escobar when he was there in Nicaragua with Barry Seal. And I just smiled and looked at the guy and said, you know, you're right. If they get you on tape, they got you, even though we were videotaping them at the time of this thing. During that conversation and such, they started to get acceptance to me. And the, and the lead guy there decided, hey, I want you to come with me. i got to introduce you to some people in town. And I said, sure, why not? I see that's an opportunity. The monitoring room paged me. It says we in a code that I knew that they captured the fact that I was going to do this. And they contacted Carl, let him know about the SOG team, see where I was going. Trouble is, it, that little adventure lasted until 6.30 the following morning, Thanksgiving morning. It was one thing right after the other. You know, I was in this guy's car, and just before midnight, he wanted to get some more liquor at a liquor store before they close. He makes a quick turn into the parking lot and blows out both tires on the right-hand side of his vehicle. And the spare he had was also flat. And I said, oh, boy, now what are we going to do? We're not close to the office either. This guy pulls up in the car. He looks like he had something to drink. The trafficker convinced him that takes us to his other friend's house. So I'm in the back seat of this unknown driver's car and this bad guy going to this friend's house. And we get there and they're cooking and doing things and having a party. And I decided to slip $20 to that guy who drove us there and convince him to drive me back to my office so I can get home. And he said, he said, sure. We left. We start going home. He decided he wanted to stop at this all night bar first. And I said, no, no, I really need to get to the office now. This won't take long. He puts it in the parking lot. And I said, the heck with this. I get out and I leave the parking lot. He's yelling at me to come with him. He gets in the car, try to follow me and find me. I start hiding from the guy. And then finally hiding in these bushes and see him just kind of get out of the area finally. And I found a pay phone. And unfortunately, I did not have my brick phone with me at the time. And that's something that you do now, carry phones with you all the time. But I called on the pay phone since I had no change to collect to the office. After the third attempt of them not accepting the call, they did finally. And I told them who I was and I needed to see the attachment to this agent who I knew lived nearby there. And at six o'clock in the morning, I get this sleepy hello on the phone. And I told the agent what I was going on. He knew me and said, the first thing out of his mouth said, does your wife know this? I said, yes, she does. And so he picks me up and he takes me to the office. But before he says, hey, since you're with me, I'm going to go by this trafficker's house. I'm going to try to get the cars that are parked there to see if I can find out who's there. And I looked at him and said, really? You and just so wanted, to, you just I just wanted, wanted to, to go home. Yeah. <laughs> so we finally got accepted and such. And I started doing countermeasures for them at various houses and meeting locations. The best part about that was... In the tools that we had as far as investigation, that a lot was going on with asset forfeiture. If you use a vehicle, use a residence, business, or whatever in the, the drug transactions or meetings or whatever like that, then that property, that vehicle, whatever conveyance is subject to being forfeited by the U.S. government. So when I would go to a house, and when you're doing countermeasures and you're searching the entire house, it can take a lot of time if you do it right. So I would cut to the chase and I asked him, says, right openly, in which I had a recorder with me that was hidden. And on tape, I'll ask him and said, which room are you concerned with when you do your drug transactions? 
and it would take me to that room. So this room right here is okay. Well, I'm going to save you time and just search this room, which I have on tape them admitting that they do drug transactions in this particular house so that we can forfeit the property very easily in a court order at some point down the road. I would also have a log, which was coded to write down the frequencies I was seeing and different things like that. And I would give them a copy of it and it says, look, I need to check this place every three months because things could change. And I use this to compare my last visit and see if something's changed and figure out if there's something there. Really what it was, I had coded the place to determine, are there weapons in the, the house? Is there a safe in the house? The type of locks that they had on the doors, were there interior locks or interior uh, bars on, on offices and different things like that. Because when you go for a, a wiretap, where it be a microphone or a telephone or mainly a microphone, and you need to record order, break into the place to install it and come out, you have to do a survey. And this is basically, I was doing the pre-survey of potential microphones that were going to be put in the house. So that way the tech agents and such would know what kind of equipment to bring in order to defeat locks or whatever else, or camera systems and such that might be there in order to them to accomplish that microphone installation. So it was very helpful in that particular uh, log that I developed for that particular type of operation. Just so that you appeared to be legit, did you ever, quote unquote, find anything? No, I didn't find anything, but I sure left some things behind. (laughs) Um, uh, You know what? Let's take some time to talk about who you were. I mean, who did they think you were? Because, you know, they're letting you into their homes or letting you into their businesses. I know that Byte has, you know told them that you're a good guy, and you're okay, but you're having conversations with them. You're sitting down and and eating and and drinking with them and socializing with them. What did you tell them? Who did they think you were? Well, when you work in undercover, especially in the Hispanic community, and going by what Joe Pistone told me to be close to what you are in real life, I was born in Texas, and so I'm a Mexican-American. You cannot imitate or say, being in Miami, that you're a Cuban background, your Colombian background, Puerto Rican, whatever, because all the Hispanic communities, all the different countries and such, their cultures different between each other. Some of the words they say in Spanish are different from each other. Their accent is different from each other. So I could not portray any of those individuals. So I had to be this Mexican-American from Texas. I grew up on the border because I'm familiar with a town near there where my mom grew up. And that I had a brother who was killed by Border Patrol trying to smuggle dope in. So I had this passion against law enforcement. And that my dad actually worked as a civilian in an Air Force base doing electronics for the B-52 bomber in real life. Where I learned the passion of electronics through him breaking those tools when he'd come home with them and just experimenting to see what he was doing, being curious, if you will. So I had that kind of a background talking about what I was doing. So coming from Texas, being a Mexican-American like that, they all knew that and accepted that. And one particular trafficker, El Chu, liked the Mexicans, had friends in the Mexicans in Mexico, the cartels, and even some Mexican federal authorities, too, who were corrupt. When he found out I was Mexican, he would call this one Mex-Fed in Mexico and tell him, and says, look, I'll buy services because the Mex Fed was interested in me coming into Mexico to sweep his office and to put wiretaps on people at the embassy and other individuals to ensure that they were not finding out that he was also corrupt and, and doing trafficking loads so he could have a heads up on that thing, which was interesting to say the least on that. So because of that, I was able to get, I guess, I guess the acceptance, if you will, of these guys of what my background was, was legit. Cool. Now, having said all that and things that were going to happen, as you know, the career development program in the FBI, there's you start out generally as a relief supervisor, which is just an agent being accepted by the career board to be a relief to the squad supervisor when he's not there or whatever. It's kind of almost like a training to get to be a supervisor. And then you can apply for positions either in the field as a supervisor of one of the squads or at headquarters as one of the program managers in one of the areas of the investigations. And so I was a release supervisor in San Juan and also in Miami. McNally told me, he says, you know, if you want to become a supervisor, we probably can find a desk here in Miami where you can stay here. And I told him, he says, well, I appreciate that, but 
I really need to know the animal, mean headquarters. It says, I really need to know what's going on and how it works in headquarters in order to be effective to me for the agents in the field when I'm a squad supervisor. This way I know who to call and not call, et cetera. And he understood that and such. And so while doing this case, I was applying for positions. And one of the areas I wanted to apply for was the drug section in the Colombian South American unit. There's several units that had different parts of the world. And all those units combined was called a section. And it was under a deputy assistant director who was under an assistant director in the criminal division, which had other programs for other violations. Well, at that time in the 80s, the drug section was the quote unquote ideal location to try to get into position because there are a lot of things going on. And competition was very fierce. Fortunate, unfortunate, whatever, I was selected. But I was also still working the case in CATCOM in November, December of 87. So Carl said, if there's an airplane crash anywhere in the world, you're on it. We're going to kill you off. That way you can go to headquarters. That never happened. So they had to figure out a way to keep me on board. So that way this case can continue on and I can go to headquarters. Now, by going to headquarters, I had a uh, full beard and I would go to work because it was Miami in boat shoes, sometimes in short pants and whatever. And at the time I was driving a C's car that we took a couple of years ago, which was a black convertible Corvette, which is a very nice car. You're going to give all that up? <laughs> well, I was in the car driving to Miami Beach. It was a beautiful day, palm trees all around. My cell phone rings and McNally says, congratulations, you just got your job at headquarters. And I'm thinking, I'm giving up all this for a cubicle in a windowless office at FBI. That's what I did. So they had to figure out a way to legitimately get me out of there, plus also bring another agent in. And we just how, how long had you been working the sting? From March, from March until uh, no, until November of '87, and my report day was going to be January of '88. So in that two month December January time frame, we had to bring in another agent. We decided to bring a female agent in. Her name is Gloria, and have it as my cousin. I was going to have the, the role that because of my tech work, I was going to go to Chicago to do some work for the Mexican traffickers there, which was legitimate. I would have a pager uh, with a Chicago area code and different things like that to use. Now, at that time, there were no GPS trackers on cell phones. There was not any caller ID going on when you make phone calls and such. So leaving and making phone calls, not in Miami, was not such a big deal at the time where they could be suspicious that you're calling from D.C. or, or Chicago or wherever. So we make up the stories and such of, of how Gloria was going to be my cousin. We set it up to where she was engaged to get married. She caught her fiancé in bed with another woman. She was scorned by that, so she wanted to get away from where she was at and come to Miami, live with me for a while until she found an apartment and such, and therefore protecting her in the way of her interest against men. She was very disgusted with the fact of what her fiancé did, so that way she won't be hit upon by the traffickers for either a date or trying to set up with a boyfriend, etc., and also a reason why she was there, and, and at the same time, it'd be good because she could be in my apartment when I leave to go to Chicago. She was quite attractive, and uh, El Chu, as well as another trafficker named Carlos Mario, took a liking to her. And El Chu, who knew a lot of the people in uh, Miami as far as drug traffickers, really got close to me because he figured if he's good with me, then I could help introduce him to Gloria. So I used that advantage to have Chu take me around to meet all the other traffickers, and he would tell them, talk to him like you're talking to my brother which basically was a kiss of death for him once they find out I was an FBI agent. So we started this integration of Gloria into the RA communications and into the area of Miami. We were invited by Carlos Mario to a residence that we found out that he wanted to have as a meeting stash house. Carlos Mario is interesting because he was the nephew of Rodriguez Gacha, which was one of the founding members of the Medellin cartel. Gacha was his best man in his wedding. And so Carlos knew a lot about him. And so we were invited to his house because he wanted to basically talk more to Gloria. So he's there cooking for us at the house. And Carlos made a business proposal to me. He says, look, he says, I'd like to go in business with you and have you help us move money to Panama and banks there. 
They said, you have a U.S. passport, which I had an undercover passport. You can travel easier as an American versus me as a Colombian, and it would be a great partnership. And he started talking about how he wanted to do that set up. I told him, says, look, he says, why don't I have Gloria take notes of this business transaction so we can use that as our template, if you will, for how we're going to do this business. He thought it was good. He gave her a piece of paper and a pen. Gloria, before coming into the Bureau, she worked for 12 years in the U.S. court system, and she knew shorthand. So she started taking all these notes in shorthand because Carlos Mares started talking about the loads he was doing with Gotcha and then other things he was doing in the drug trade and what he wanted to do and such. And she's writing all these notes down in shorthand. And then when we sit down to dinner and I look at that piece of paper and it says, Carlos, this is our charter for our new business. Why don't you sign it? I'll sign it and date it. And we'll have Gloria witness this thing and we'll hang it up in our office. So he signs it. I sign it. Gloria signs as a witness. We put a date on it. I said, Carlos, I got a great idea. I got a camera in my car. Let's take a picture with us with this thing. So this way we can hang that in the office next to the piece of paper, which you thought was a great idea. So we'd get this photograph of all three of us holding up this piece of paper, which in effect was his confession. And we took a picture. But that house, Carlos Mario wanted us to do a sweep. We wanted to see about putting a microphone in there. So when I was doing the sweep, I had a device that was similar to one that he had in his house. And I took the one in his house out. And Carl's asked me, he says, hey, can I help you do this stuff? Sure. So I gave him the device with the microphone and a screwdriver. He says, here, just do this, this, and this. And I had him basically install his own microphone at his stash house. And then I was at go to headquarters. And then headquarters, when you get a wiretap authorization, the field office puts the affidavit together. It goes to legal there. Then it goes to headquarters review and legal review. And it goes up the chain to the directors who sign off before it goes to DOJ and get their review, and then go back down to the field office when they take it before a judge to get it signed. Well, I did the installation. I did the stuff at the at the house with Carlos Mario. So now I'm back at headquarters, running around with a full beard still. Everybody's thinking I was a DEA supervisor being cross-trained between DEA and FBI headquarters. So they didn't think I was an FBI agent most of the time when I walked around the building. So I got the affidavit from Miami. I'm taking it up the chain to get the signatures. And I go to Buck Ravel, who was acting director at the time, and gave the affidavit for his final signature before he sent it to Miami for the judge. Buck looks at the thing and says, are you familiar with this case? And I said, yes, sir. And he says, how good is this? Well, it's actually very good, sir. And I explained a little bit about the case. He says, do you know the undercover that's in this case here? I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, it's me. He looks up and says, you? <laughs> he said, yes, sir, it's me. I got promoted during the case, and the case is still ongoing. That's why I'm here. He said, I thought you were DEA. I know, sir. I'm FBI, believe it or not. And so he looks, and he says, okay, did you see dope in the place? Yeah, there are some there, but there's more coming, and there's going to be meetings taking place there because I was already there with a meeting with them. He says, okay, that's good enough for me. So he signs it, and then he started referring to that particular meeting as somebody with walking PC or walking probable cause, because you need probable cause in order to have the basis for your affidavit. And so he said, I had walking probable cause into my office. I signed off in the wiretap. I've had the pleasure of interviewing Buck Ravel twice on this show. If you ever talk to Buck Ravel again, see if he remembers walking PC. I will. <laughs> <laughs> So we were doing all these different things, and we, we were trying to figure out how to start taking this case down. It was We were developing a lot of information. We were seizing a lot of loads. So we were taking in all kinds of intelligence and such like that, and it was getting to the point to where everybody was getting tired. We were not being suspicious, being exposed, or anything like that by others. We were having increasingly more law enforcement being interested in us because as they were dealing with people and they were getting suspicious of what RA communications was, but before the case came down, we had identified 22,000 subjects and references that were added to the intelligence file. We had produced 800 reports. We had traced 26,000 phone calls and conducted 2,900 surveillances. And we were still going. And we decided we needed to do something to stop it. Too much of a good thing. Too much of a good thing. November of 88, they brought me back to help set up the final transactions, if you will, to bring the case down. We had December 8th of 88 as the target date. Gloria and I were setting up transactions with other traffickers to, to actually buy dope. And my customers was going to be the Mexican traffickers I had established up in Chicago and different things like that. We had undercovers up there that were doing phone calls and trying to set that up. So we're basically trying to gear everything so that on December the 8th, 
all this would come to a head and we could make all these arrests. The grand jury was going on. The initial AUSA needed assistance. We had a little bit over 20 AUSAs helping on the indictment in the various aspects of this case. There were 93 people indicted in this case. There were seven organizations itself that were tied to the Medellin cartel that we were going after, identified in this case. And we were starting to bring things together. On the last day, Gloria was setting up meetings with people that she had conducted one-on-one purchases of cocaine from. Because even though we had conspiracy type violations on these main leadership that would come into RA communications or these boats and planes that were seizing, we still wanted to have a one-on-one purchase of cocaine or some drug between those guys in order to have a solid case as far as uh, possession. I would do that with some of the people, but they were sometimes reluctant, and some of the higher ups were even more reluctant to do it with me. However, with Gloria and her ability to sweet talk them, they were buying whatever she wanted. And she was the designated as the lead one on one purchaser of the case and would do these transactions in RA communications, money kind of machine going on that she was providing them and get the cocaine. And we had these solid one on one handoffs of kilos of cocaine between all of the major traffickers they were dealing with at the time, besides the conspiracy cases on the hundreds of kilos that they were bringing in. So it was a good technique at the time. So Gloria was setting that up for additional loads to be taken down. Byte and Bit were also setting that up. We were also in the process on the last day of relocating Byte and Bit and their family. I was at the office as left to close the office. I had one more transaction to do. This individual who is a known hitman, was going to be coming to meet me because he wanted me to find a warehouse for him because they were going to smuggle 1,600 M16 ARs to Colombia for the cartel. Wow. So now this becomes a drug and gun running investigation. Correct. So he comes into the office to meet me about my progress of finding his warehouse. And even though he's a hitman and he had a bodyguard who was literally the size of the doorway of the office. He kind of stood there in the, at the doorway and the hit man would sit at the couch and I'll be at the chair across from him talking, knowing that the SWAT team's next door to come in and arrest us, wondering that it's what time we had to do this because the other transactions had to take place out with Gloria and Byte and Bit and such. So that was coordinated. So I had to do small talk, waiting for that bewitching hour for the takedown, which was noon. While we're talking, I asked him, you know, okay, so you're a hitman. He says, have you ever killed anybody just because you wanted to kill him? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I killed six people. He says, really? He says, why did you want to kill them? He pulls down this collar and he shows us these, these scars on his neck and his chest. He obtained those from a lab explosion in Columbia, fire burns and fire scars. He said, they were making fun of my scars. And so I looked at him in a straight face and I said, what scars? And he laughed. And luckily, he laughed because I didn't want to make fun of him. And at the time, the SWAT team came in and took us down, me included, thinking that I was a trafficker as well. The case was ended at that time. The phone rang as I was walking out at the time by the sofa. And I picked up the phone. And believe it or not, it was Juan David Ochoa from the cartel. He was calling to thank us for all the work we did as far as providing them with the ability to hide his people. And I told him, he says, well, you're quite welcome. He says, do you want to meet? <laughs> and he, he said, no, I can't. And he hung up. So it was an interesting end to that particular case. So he, he had no idea that the case was coming down at that moment and all of these arrests were being made? That's correct, because the press conference itself did not happen until later on that afternoon. And actually, Brian Ross from, I think it was NBC, approached the FBI to try to do something on drugs. And they were actually were surveilling us at RA Communications for some video. And they actually did a two-minute piece on the national news about the case going down. And back then at that time on December of 1988. But it didn't really end there for Byte. Byte did such an exceptional job that we relocated them. We wanted to see about how that we can continue this type of operation throughout the United States. And before we took it down, the San Francisco division was going to open up a cellular telephone business like we did in RA Communications, and they were going to utilize Byte as their source. That the FBI, because he was a non-criminal businessman and does such an exceptional job, we actually got an authorization to provide undercover identification to him for his relocation. 
And we provided that so he can go to San Francisco. And he's there in San Francisco to do that operation. San Francisco is concerned that we're doing this press coverage in the national news about exposing this type of a technique. And I told the San Francisco division, because going back to my headquarters program manager position at FBI, it says, okay, it says, how many of the hundreds of cellular phone businesses in this country are FBI, DEA, or whatever, and which are legit? Nobody knows. It all depends how you good is your source, how good is your intelligence in order to bring customers in, because people have to communicate. And if you harness their communications and understand it, you got that organization. So what happened later on is I think Unsolved Mysteries had an episode about this case with some of our fugitives. Byte was in the office of the San Francisco undercover operation. He had two bad guys in there and they're watching TV. And they were talking about the Miami case on TV. They turned to Byte and told him, said, boy, look at that. I'm glad we're here working with you, not knowing that Byte was the one that did the thing in Miami. So we had it on videotape to show that we could still do this technique. So when that case ended, which was called MOCOM for more communications, I was a supervisor now at Washington Field Office, and I brought him over to work in an undercover group one called Bitec, which is another type of communication case we did, which was successful. And then after that was done, Customs wanted to do the similar thing, so we had him go to another state to do that for Customs. Unfortunately, at that particular time, Byte, while waiting at the undercover office for the UCA and some bad guys to show up for a meeting, had a, an aneurysm and died. He died there at the undercover offsite. So wow. we had to arrange as the UCA and bad guys came in for an ambulance to come in. When he passed away, we had to have an undercover death certificate made up, and different things to keep the, the operation going there for customs and allow the UCA to continue. And uh, we made the services and such for bite and whatever else. He was a he was a true hero as far as what he was doing for the country and for the FBI. And I don't want to take away from that thought by asking this question, but what did he get from this? I mean, it's a lot of work traveling and moving from Miami to San Francisco, D.C. How was he compensated? We had a, a budget that would allow us to pay him a uh, monthly retainer, if you will. We paid for his apartment. He would use the retainer to pay for his living expenses, gasoline, etc. If we traveled, we would travel under our dime to travel, but all undercover basis. At the end of the case, both Bit and Byte were able to obtain a lump sum reward for their cooperation which took a lot of steps at FBHQ to approve, which was kind of the advantage of me being a supervisor there because I was able to walk this payment through and explain to the leadership all the way up the line to the director why they should justify paying this guy and his, and his son. Also, so you know, his son later became a citizen and actually is a supervisor in a major police department right now. So he actually went into law enforcement after this case. Oh, that's a nice, uh, happy ending. When you're working an undercover case, especially when you talk about the incident that happened the morning of Thanksgiving, how much does your family know and how much concern do you have that your undercover role will either spill over into your family life or take you away from your family obligations? Well, that is a very difficult time and such. We took great care when I would leave RA Communications with my Corvette going to a warehouse district, which I was able to get into a warehouse and be able to see if anybody was following me and then change vehicles to my regular car and then go home, which was further north of Miami. At the time, married, I had my son who was at six years old. And the story I would put to the bad guys, you know, when they were asking me about dates and such, that I was dating this female who was divorced and had a kid. So if I was ever be seen by these guys wherever doing something off duty, if you will, it can go back to that. But you don't go into details about what you're doing other than your, your meeting. But one of the key things we did on this case that a lot of cases they don't do is every week on the Monday morning, someplace Carl would find a location, a hotel generally with a conference room. And everybody involved with the case, to include Byte and Bit, the team leader from the SOG, the translators, the monitoring room, the supervisor, even the AUSA, we would meet and discuss the case, what happened the week before, and what's going to happen that week. 
So during those discussions, there are things that are going to be coming up that are going to be away from the house more or something's going to happen that might be dangerous. I would have an opportunity to tell my spouse to say, hey, look, this is going to happen. I'm not knowing the details, but, you know, we're going to be doing this. I'm going to be out of town or I'm going to be in Key West or whatever. Carl will be the person that you contact if you have questions. Well, and, and talking to other people about working undercover, one of the things that they said is that at some point they started to enjoy the people that they were working against. The actual targets, they developed a a quasi-friendship because they were around them so much. Would you say that happened with you? Because you're in and out of the homes of these individuals. You're meeting their family members. When the case finally came down, did you feel any, I I don't, I know the word is not regret because you knew what the, the purpose of your job was, but did you feel anything? Well, yes, you do. You you do befriend them, if you will, but you got to keep that focus of what you're there for. Children and spouses came to the office as well. When we had social settings, you know, like the stone says, you know, bad guys go to the movies too. You were doing things that were normal, family dinner, get together, holidays, whatever it may be. But it was all part of playing that role and being ingratiated with their way of life. So that way you're not suspicious. But when it came down, you also had this sense of relief that was actually over because you did not have to hide or have to walk on eggshells of what you say and what you do that might expose the case or cause somebody to be in danger because of that. So you do have that sense of relief that helps you. But, you know, it's a tragedy that these guys get involved with their families and such, and they go away for a long time in prison because of what they were doing. And so you feel sorry for them versus the bad guy themselves. I remember this time period of all of these big drug cartel investigations, and there were a lot of shootouts and killings between drug organizations. Did any of that occur during the time period you were investigating this case? There were actually shootings taking place. And and when I was Working with Bob Levinson and debriefing sources and such, some of the people we actually spoke with were actually assassinated and we were finding them in trunks of cars or floating in the ocean. I remember six active sources I had open uh, for us to monitor and such like that were quasi on the fence of being the bad guy still and, and they all died. It was almost like a way of life. We were having issues, t- too, with Miami Vice being filmed at the time, uh, the original TV series, because the techniques that was coming up on the show of Undercover, what Crockett and Tubbs were doing, these guys would talk about it in RA Communications. You had to play all that and understand that, that, that death is part of this particular thing. I've been to crime scenes as a police officer for shootings and killings and and actually had people die in my arms that had been shot. So it was not something new to me, but it it kind of, you know, I don't want to say hardens you, but it it gets you to the point where it's acceptable. This is what actually is going to happen. And if you don't think it doesn't happen, then then I'm sorry, you're going the wrong path in your thinking. Sadly, I was in Miami before we started CATCOM when the the Miami shooting took place. We had Morella's involvement and, and all the Jerry Dove and Ben Grogan were killed. And unfortunately, I was at the scene after it had happened and participated in the search warrants of the bad guys on that thing. So I was seeing my own people being agents and back when I was a police officer, colleagues you know, killed on the line of duty. And that hardens you in, in a sense, you know, what you're doing that one, you got to be careful. And two, you have a purpose of what you're doing to put people away. So what were the results of the CATCOM undercover operation? We had 93 subjects indicted. At the time of the arrest, when we took place in Miami, 65 were arrested. We only had six trials, which were all found guilty. All the other people who pled guilty with the average sentencing of 15 years. There were seven direct trafficking groups that we tied to the Medellin cartel that were their agents or lead individuals in the U.S. supplying or distributing cocaine for them. The arrests also took place in Tampa and New York. And we were able to identify a very unique process and how they operate, which was intelligence shared to all the agencies. I would do briefings at the CIA as well as DEA regarding what we did and how we did and how they operated in order for them to figure out how to best collect additional intelligence. And it was very, very successful. It was something new, something that was unique at the time because of the opportunity that cell phones were new on the market and the communications were there. 
The FBI is very good doing undercover operations of all types of violations. You had app scam for corruption. You had, of course, the Donnie Brasco, you know, with Joe Pistone. There's very good techniques that are out there for all kinds of violations, healthcare fraud, etc. The imagination of the agents and the, and the people that come up with these ideas is unlimited. I would never be surprised about any next new technique that comes out that's exposed. We talked a little bit about Bob Levinson. Talk about the ultimate sacrifices that he made after he retired as an FBI agent. Bob and I were really close down in Miami as partners working these cases. And Bob did a lot of different things for the Bureau regarding Russian organized crime, etc. I had the pleasure, if you want to call it that, of speaking to Bob about a month before he was taken by Iranian intelligence services. He was down in Miami, this house in Coral Springs, and we were talking about, you know, what's going on and different things we had done in the past. And he had his kids there and he said, life is good. I got my family. I'm doing these great things and such. And they said, that's great, Bob. I'm really glad you're enjoying yourself. And that was the last time I spoke with him. And then he got captured and such. And it was really, really was heartbreaking, you know, all that ordeal with him. And it was really hard news to hear for the entire FBI family back in March of 2020, when we learned that in all likelihood, Bob had died in Iranian custody. And, uh, you know, he was captured for 13 years. Bob was a fighter. When he was debriefing sources, he would learn Spanish. He would learn how to get into the uh, confidence of the individual. So it wouldn't surprise me when he's being captured by whoever in Iran that he was learning Farsi. That he was getting the into the heads of the, his captors because I think uh, that was one of the reasons why he survived so long in captivity is because he was able to do that. Well, Bob Levinson, rest in peace. Yes, rest in peace. We're at the time now where we get to learn a little bit more about you. So my question is, when did you join the FBI and why did you join the FBI? Well, I guess it could start back when I was 12 years old. I had a cousin of mine who was a police officer in San Antonio, and he allowed my brother and I to sit in his squad car, turn on the siren and the red light. And so I decided I wanted to be a cop. Texas State University had a criminal justice program in San Marcos, Texas. So I went to there to get that degree and be a street cop like my cousin. But everybody said, once you go into college, oh, you're going to be an FBI agent. And I said, no, I really didn't think that. So I started with Dallas Police Department doing patrol and then the tactical division and then the SWAT team, then I was a hostage negotiator. And as a hostage negotiator, there was an insert being sponsored by the FBI in the area. When I attended that seminar, I was approached by two agents. They said, hey, ever thought about joining the FBI? And this was in the late 1970s. And I said, well, you know, I never really thought about it. So they gave me an application. I applied, took the tests and different things like that. Did the overview board. Next thing I knew, in October of 1980, I was going to Quantico, Virginia to be in the FBI Academy. And I graduated in January of 81. When President Reagan was being sworn in as the president, I was sworn in as an agent. Yeah, what a fabulous career you had in the FBI. What are you doing now? When I retired from the FBI, I got a job with Shell Oil Company as their global security manager. And I did that for five and a half years. And I ran across a friend of mine from the agency who was now starting a business to do helicopter drones. And this is back in 2010 when it was really just starting to get into vogue about doing drones. And I've worked a lot with him for a few years. And then I decided to be a consultant and a contractor friend of mine. We worked with law enforcement agencies, government agencies, commercial clients, and even law firms in analyzing uh, data to find the needles in the haystack in a very quick and efficient way for them to do their cases. You know, as somebody who rose from special agent all the way up to the assistant director of the Los Angeles division, you have learned a lot of lessons. You've got to have some thoughts, some words of wisdom for those listening. What would you like to say? Two areas. Those that are still agents, I, I tell this to everybody, you know, talk to me about career development and everything else. Don't cheat yourself out of the time you spend in each position because you can only learn so much from a book, watching movies, or playing video games. You don't know really until you actually live it through as an actual experience to learn what you really need to learn. But those who are not agents are thinking about becoming a law enforcement. 
I just say this, if you have a good imagination and you want to have an adventurous career, join the FBI. You're not going to find any other job like this where you can use your mind to come up with a case and take that case wherever you need to go by your ability to write the justification. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, in the show notes for this episode, you'll find a photo of Rich Garcia. Rich actually provided several photos from the CATCOM UCO, including that photo of Rich, Gloria, and Carlos with his signed confession. There are also lots of links to newspaper articles and books about this major undercover operation. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. I would also love it if you checked out the link for my books, and your podcast app's description of this episode. My nonfiction books, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI in books, TV, and movies. And then there's the companion book, FBI Word Search Puzzles, fun for armchair detectives. My FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad crime series, features flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler in Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. All of my books are available wherever books are sold as ebooks, print books, and audiobooks. If you've already picked up copies of my books, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.